Hi. Um, welcome. It's a, this is Voices in the Wilderness. Uh, we are a show to address questions posed by skeptics and Christians and non-Christians. Um, one struggling to reconcile faith and science, um, people who are deconstructing or reconstructing or curious or working through um, questions in their mind from how they were raised to what they're understanding now. And so we're so glad you guys are all joining us today. If you have questions, you can uh, te text the questions in the comment section, either on YouTube or Facebook. Uh, and we'll try to get to some of your questions toward the end of the interview. Um, so uh, welcome, Greg and Ken. Um, hi, it's, it's almost Christmas. Um, do you guys have like plans for this week? Uh, you're both professors, so you're off of school now, done grading and everything. Yeah, so I, I'm a, a little bit older than, than Ken, so I actually have uh, my first grandson just born this past month. So for the first time ever, instead of us traveling to someplace for Christmas, we are the destination. We have family coming and all landing at our house. Looking forward to it. Yeah, and our, our general tradition is my, my in-laws live in Kentucky. So that's where we always go because my family's back in Arizona and Las Vegas. So it's much easier to go north for a few hours than fly west. Okay. So we usually, we usually spend about a week up there. Nice. Um, we're hosting my side of the family this year. And then my husband's side of the family, we're going to um, a hotel near the nursing home where his mom lives. So um, it will be... Nice to see family, um, trying to be careful with COVID and all. How about you, John? What are you guys doing? Uh, we are hosting uh, my brother-in-law, who's a paleontologist, uh, studying to be a paleontologist. He's coming in with his two kids. So we're going up to Sedona. We're doing some hiking here in Arizona. We're going on the uh, boat. We're doing all the kinds of things that you can't do right now in Minnesota. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, we're going to enjoy the weather and, and enjoy some family time. Yeah, that's true. We wouldn't want to be boating here right now. Yeah. <laughs> it wouldn't work very well. Yeah, we, we got about it. three inches of snow yesterday, and it's oh. kind of pretty, as long as you're inside with a blanket. Yeah. <laughs> well, in high school, I actually competed in downhill and cross-country skiing, so I, I, I grew up kind of liking snow. Yeah. Okay. Well, one of our daughters did Nordic skiing her senior year of high school, and she enjoyed it. Wow. Uh, she likes the skate skiing better than the traditional cross country. I don't style, want to rub but... it into the rest of you, but Arizona is one of the few states in the union where you can you can sunbathe and ski on the same day. So if I want to see <laughs> snow, I'll drive two hours north to Flagstaff. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, I'm, I'm from Prescott, so I know, I know that truism very well. <laughs> oh. Well, that's the perfect place to live. The perfect weather. Yes. There not too hot. Not, it's the Goldilocks zone. Yeah. Nice. Nice. I, I could use just a little less winter in my life, if I'm honest. I... Yeah. Well, we're excited um... to have both of you on. Uh, folks, you're seeing the book, The Manifold Beauty of Genesis 1, in the center of your screen there, a multi-layered approach. It's writ written by Greg Davidson and Kenneth J. Turner, who join us today. I guess I want to start with uh, the Well, question. let's do an introduction of them, okay? Ah, okay, yeah. Yeah. Sounds good. All right. Well, uh, just so you know, everybody knows who we have. We have Dr. Ken Turner, who earned a PhD in Old Testament theology from Southern Baptist Theological Seminary and is professor of Old Testament and biblical language at Tacoa Falls College. He has written books and contributed chapters and articles on a variety of biblical theological topics, including several on origins and the doctrine of creation. His interest in origin stems from his background, including a bachelor's degree in physics and math education from Arizona State University. His interaction with college students and his involvement in the homeschool world. Welcome, Ken. We also have Dr. Greg Hi. Davidson, a professor and department chair of geology and geological engineering at the University of Mississippi. His day job includes research in geochemistry and hydrology 
with lots of time spent in the cypress swamps of Mississippi. His dissertation at the Arizona University of Arizona included many hours in the same radiocarbon lab that dated the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Shroud of Turin. He describes his upbringing as the odd and wonderful product of having two preacher grandfathers and a bio biologist for a father, raised to uniquely appreciate God's written and natural world. Later, concern over misconceptions about both science and the Bible led to many articles and books, and I have to show you, highly recommend some of these books of his. Great, great, great buy, great Christmas gifts. We've had about um, everyone who, who co-authored the, the And the And band this band one too. On. So uh, speaking Wonderful. engagements across the U.S. and several continents. More at gregdavidson.net. Thanks for joining us, Greg. Glad to be joining you. Yep. So jumping back in, the book, um, why this book and how did it come together uh, from the two of you? Yeah, so the, the, the basic idea of the book was mine. Uh, and it derived from a, a, a basic recognition that when people are talking about the Bible in general, They'll talk about the richness of the text where you, know, you can read it 10 times and the 11th time you see something new. Um, but because a lot of the angst that's been created over apparent tensions between science and the Bible, that, that conversation has collapsed to these singular discussions of what is the single monochromatic understanding of the Genesis text. And we've lost that richness, that sense of, of wonder that there is there are layers to this text. Now, having that idea was awesome, but I also was aware of my own limitations that, uh, you know, I didn't want to get off on these bunny trails that, that sounded great to me, but didn't really have really sound exegetical basis. And I knew Ken from previous uh, interactions and highly respected him and the way he writes and approached him about joining to co-author this. And I'm very happy to say he agreed. Ken may want to add something to that. Yeah, I, the one thing I would add is that uh, as I've had this discussion slash debate on origins, um, what has always, other than the kind of the vitriol <laughs> and the kind of the, the warfare mentality, just the fact that all sides, really any any of the major positions that are in this discussion sing so much about the text. And uh, Greg talked about the richness, and, and as you can see, we talk about different layers, but there's some pretty basic stuff in the text that was being overlooked to emphasize other things. And so I thought the text was being lost, no matter where you ended up on those other issues. And so this was an opportunity to to try to contribute, you know, to to the the layperson world at least, the things that you know, eggheads in my field are really concentrating on. Well, speaking of those eggheads, um, the theologians who might be listening, is this a whole new hermeneutic, or is this something that you're um, maybe just bringing forward to the layman that exists? Does it work with other portions of scripture? Uh, and we might as well start with you, Ken. Yeah, it, it's definitely not new. Uh, Greg already alluded to a even a, a basic approach to the Bible where you have, um, a, again, the word keeps coming up as richness. But you could, we even talked about this in our introductory uh, chapter about um, looking at messianic texts that can be read in various ways. Um, you could compare, uh, we've, we've got a section there comparing the two different genealogies of Jesus. And, and you go throughout church history, th this is actually a pretty common thing. We're not, we're not talking about competing uh, views of authorial intent. We're talking that even a, natural readings can come from different angles, um, and especially since we're dealing with an eternal God and dealing with his revelation. We shouldn't be surprised that there's going to be um, people who come from one angle, but it doesn't necessarily deny another angle and area of emphasis I think one of the, the the proofs, I guess, that this isn't anything new, many of the authors were drawing on on particular layers within the book, endorsed the book, and said, said explicitly that they appreciated the multi-layered approach. Yeah, and I, I just would add one thing to that, that um, 
you know, if you just leave it with there's nothing new in this book, then people are like, well, what do I need to read it for? Uh, the, the one thing that is is new at least to this conversation in, in our generation is bringing all these pieces together to make people realize that that hey it's it, it this is not doesn't have to boil down to a four views of fill in the, the blank theological issue that that it is possible that many of these different uh, perspectives and understandings of the genesis text that come from conservative biblical scholarship are actually compatible they're not necessarily in competition with each other um, so when I first read the title of this book and this multi-layered approach, um, the image that popped into my mind was Shrek describing himself as having all these layer, the layers of an onion. Um, I just have to stop you there, folks. She's the rocket scientist. I, I'm, I, I'm just saying, but go ahead. Okay. So the layers of the onion, um, and, and how this is like really different approach than say a four views book, like you mentioned, where you pick one of the four views. Uh, this is kind of a, a multi-layer where you can have all the different layers, I guess, and make onion rings maybe. Um, yeah, so, and we don't want to so, give the impression, we, we don't want to give the impression that this is sort of a, the Bible means whatever you want it to mean. You know, bring, bring your own interpretation and we can all just sit around the campfire for a kumbaya moment. Uh, th there's plenty of ways to get the text wrong. And we have very intentionally drawn on the work of scholars that believe in the authority and inspiration of scripture. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Um, we want to make sure we're being faithful to the text and not just making it be what we want. Um, did you think some of the layers are more obvious or easier to see than others? Yeah, certainly. And I'll, I'll, I'll let Ken weigh in maybe first and then, you maybe know, maybe, up. maybe before Ken weighs in, maybe one of you or both of you can give, give us the layers um, yeah. that oh, are in the yeah, book, good idea. seven layers. Um, <clears throat> you, you could tell seven us what layers the layers are and why seven. Uh, well, so anybody that knows the significance of the number seven in the Bible can, can guess why we, we kind of set our target on seven. Uh, we, we weren't going to like make up something to try to get to seven, but we definitely set out that, you know, if we could come up with seven really defensible uh, uh, layers, that would be awesome. Kind of probably five of them were very, very easy and natural to come up with. And then through discussions, a, a couple others that we really felt good about. So they, the first one is, is the song, which focuses on some of the, the poetic aspects of the text, that it's like a hymn of creation that that also then um, it makes use of the framework uh, idea that people may be aware of. There's the analogy to the human work week. There's the polemic against the common beliefs of the surrounding worldview systems. Uh, there's a covenant layer. There's a temple layer uh, focusing on the, the idea of the, the cosmic mountain god uh, in heaven, meeting with, with people on earth through the temple. There's a, a calendar layer that is uh, building off the work of Michael Lefevre, published a, a book just recently. And then the land layer, which is looking at the parallels between Eden and Canaan and Adam and the story of Israel. Yeah, and I would say in terms of the original question, uh, there, it kind of moves from uh, most simple and most known for those who might be in these discussions already to more complex and unknown. And so there is, uh, you could quibble about, you know, one or two of them, but there is a general kind of movement where the first, the first three layers, especially the song, the analogy and the polemic for anybody who's done any kind of study would, would come across some of this discussion. The covenant for those who are from a systematic theological background, especially a reformed tradition, might be aware of um, the, the debates going on with whether it's a creation covenant. And then the last three, the temple is becoming more well-known because of the work of Greg Beale and John Walton. 
Um, but then the last two are a bit going to be a bit more. The, the calendar layer by Lefevre is the newest, only a couple years really out. And then unless somebody's really familiar with the work of John Salehammer uh, and Seth Postel, his student, uh, that'll be a really new read as well. You know, uh, these seven layers, uh, you're going to argue that they were intentional by the author or authors. Is, is that right? Um, but when you speak of the, the views that are current, in other words, they're more known since the Reformation, since we kicked over Asher Benipple's library and wandered <laughs> into the ancient Near East, it, it, is your, uh, how do you answer the critic that says these are Johnny come lately's that, that the only reason you added these three layers possibly are because um, secular science has taken us there or what have you? I guess I'll start, Greg. Um, so yeah, this is a common charge and something we're sensitive to. Um, in one sense, that can be true of any development in theology. But the fact of the matter is when you actually come through earlier rabbinic and early church writings, there are pieces of these. They may not be the full developed kind of view or reading, but there are pieces that are consistent. So when we say new, we don't mean the pieces are, are, are necessarily new. But there is also the broader question that I think your question's hinting at is, you know, why th this whole, you know, the last 250, 300 years, we, we have these new uh, discoveries of the ancient Near Eastern world and they open up to us. Um, well, part of that, I would just, you know, deal within the, the area of providence that God provided us uh, more information that, that helps us. Nobody can discount the, the, advantage it has to have some background information. Uh, the early church did not have really a lot of, of great insight into the ancient world. Most, I mean, all but one or one and a half of them knew any Hebrew before Jerome came along. Um, and, and so I guess I don't see the problem if with new information, it, it adds to understanding the basic meaning of words and phrases all the way to larger concepts. And, and some have even suggested that maybe in god's providence this is speculation that it's interesting that the rise of the the world of the ancient race was open to us around the time of, of modern scientific theories and it may have given us uh, a way to read the text responsibly that doesn't necessarily need to deny everything that's coming through general revelation like like scientific theories So let's talk a little bit about, um, oh, how about, how about let's talk a little bit more about uh, Michael Lefevre's view on the calendar layer, because that's probably Sure, jump in the deep end, why don't you? <laughs> that's probably one that's not as common, maybe not as many people are aware of it. Um, and, and so tell us what this layer is and, and why we should, I mean, like when I first read that book, I was like, I never thought about agricultural calendars and planting right. seasons, and it was completely new ideas to me. But maybe people who grew up in more of a agricultural environment, it would be more obvious to them. Yeah, so I'm gonna Ken's yeah, gonna so answer this, but I'm gonna but I'm gonna just say, leading into Ken's answer, that it, it's important for us to to let people know that we're not suggesting that this is an all or nothing proposition where if you don't right. see all seven then the whole the whole concept is is you know toss it out if people read this and only three or four of the layers really resonated that's still a major win because people are realizing yeah. that the, the the scripture's not just about one singular layer of understanding it's a richer text so with that I'll let Ken dive in with the calendar layer right yeah even even I am am and more confident of some than others uh so in one sense, you had mentioned the agricultural calendar. It's worth reading just for that, even if you don't have Genesis 1 on your mind. Uh, even as a scholar, a PhD in this stuff, I learned a lot. Uh, funny backstory, I was asked by a, a different publisher that ended up publishing the book to be kind of a, a blind reader of the manuscript. And somehow my name got outed. And so the author and I started an internet friendship. And it, thankfully, it ended up uh, being published by IVP. Um, but 
here's where he begins. In one sense, this is the oldest view, biblically, because the, the Sabbath commandment, the fourth commandment in Exodus, directly ties a, a certain rhythm of six plus one for working, right? Ties it within the, the creation account. Of course, we could debate what exactly is that tie, but, but in some ways, the creation account is thought of in some ways as a calendar. Uh, and more specifically, on day four of creation, uh, our translations sometimes don't help us when it talks about God created days and seasons and then years. The word for seasons is not thinking particularly weather, like we have summer, winter, autumn, spring. It's really sacred seasons. These are talking about the, the actual festivals of worship for Israel. And so there's a tie-in within the creation account that it was whatever God was doing, he was definitely intending to link it to worship. And so those go way back. Early Christians and Jews have always seen those connections. What Lefevre does is kind of create kind of a systematic approach to this. And much of the book, as you alluded to, uh, is really about what's going on in the Pentateuch. And there's some really crazy observations that have to be accounted for. And namely, the fact that um, in two particular narratives, the flood narrative and the Exodus wilderness wandering narrative, what we find is that there's, there are what are called timestamp dates, where you get the exact month and day of the month that a certain event happened. Now, of the, which is an, a rare thing, especially in Genesis, uh, back in the Pentateuch. That's just not a common way of keeping time. Usually it's, you know, two years after such and such happened, then this happened. But to actually have a, a, a day of a month is very unusual. And of those 21 instances, 16 of them link directly to an exact day of Israel's worship calendar, say in Leviticus. So then you start asking, so what's going on with that? Why, why, especially in the flood story, right? We're kind of in the prehistoric, proto-historical. Why would we care about the specific day of the month? And so Lefebvre's making the point that, that the story doesn't deny the historical account of a flood, but that certain dates are, are being given not to give you an actual day that this happened if you got in your time machine and went back, but that the day of the month is, is telling the story and this party in light of this specific festival. It gets even deeper than that, and I think I'm already kind of a basic approach. But then he takes those insights and says, look, we could do the same thing with Genesis 1, Rather than dealing with an agricultural annual calendar, now we're dealing with a week. Larger points of connecting um, this timing of God's creation is not to, to figure out the timing of God's creation, but that our weekly kind of rhythm of work and rest uh, is meant to towards worshiping God. That's about as simple as I can make it. So as we're coming up on a holiday this week with Christmas, um, you know, I was thinking about some of the examples in in the book about um, how in the U U.S. when we when we celebrate certain holidays, sometimes we celebrate them on the same date each year, like Christmas is the twenty fifth of December, but some like President's Day or Memorial Day or even Thanksgiving, they kind of shift around and don't tie directly with the historical date when that event occurred. So um, is that kind of something similar to what, what they're doing in, the, in this calendar view? That's a good modern analogy that we don't think of those dates. So it is funny being on social media and people arguing once again, December 25th isn't Jesus' real birthday, like anybody was actually arguing that. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's a helpful modern assessment that we, we assign dates for certain reasons. Maybe we've lost those reasons and don't care about them anymore. But none of us are thinking people are lying to us. You know, my sister will always make a birth, birthday cake for Jesus on Christmas. Um, you know, it, we don't think people are lying by, by kind of assigning event to kind of a made up date. So I think it's a good analogy. Yeah, they're, they're dates of observance as opposed to dates of occurrence. Right, right. I want yeah, e Easter is a classic example because, I mean, talk about a date that floats around. And <laughs> yeah. and yet, you know, you don't hear big arguments about people saying that that, that, that the Easter date is a lie. You know, we, we just all know that it's 
there's some formula at work that decides when we're actually going to observe the celebration of the resurrection. A few quick interactions with our people watching online. Eddie Adams says, I have read Grand Canyon, Monument to an Ancient Earth, probably two or three times, a great book for a layman like me. I'm looking forward to reading this book. Thank you, Eddie. And then from Dr. Clark Van Gilder, we get, I really dig this approach because it gives a deep dive to the test I like to present to folks where you read Genesis 1, looking for scientific facts, then again, looking for historical facts, and then finally for theological truths. Then decide which one you want to keep, which is obviously, for me at least, theological. A rank ordering of these seven layers tells us something about one's theological thinking. I believe one can even worship a little by going there. Thank you, Clark. Which leads me to my question about the manifold beauty of Genesis 1. I think it's clearly that your book and the seven layers are arguing for a theological beauty that may have been missing from the conversation about Genesis 1 for the last few generations, which seems to have taken a concordist view of the text. Uh, for those of you who don't understand that kind of language, uh, it's what Clark just mentioned, that you're reading into Genesis basically a historically eyewitness view of the beginning of the universe and, and the way uh, things have come about cosmologically, um, geologically, and biologically. And so uh, for, for each of you gentlemen, maybe starting with you first, Greg, is that correct to say that you're trying to resurrect the beauty of the theology here and that you're basically arguing, folks, when we argue about um, young earth, old earth, when we argue about the meaning of yam, it's quite possible we're missing the beauty around us. Um, and and I, to not be outdone by my rocket scientist host, uh, co-host, um, I, uh, I will reference um, Bruce Lee in... Um, Enter the dragon when he points to the moon and he's telling a student, um, you don't concentrate too much on the finger because you'll miss the glory of the heavenly body. There you go. Uh, so yes, that, that, that was an apt description. And what we were recognizing was that, uh, as a culture, we don't, we don't realize the degree to which our own cultural history influences how we view and interpret scripture. So about the 16th, 17th centuries in the Western world, you have the rise of humanistic thinking and the enlightenment and the scientific methodology where there was a sense in which the highest form of truth was this rationalistic, scientific, humanistic way of, of reasoning. Well, I, our people today have come up through that cultural transition. And what people don't realize is the extent to which we've taken this sense that science is the highest form of truth and then said, well, therefore, Genesis 1 and the creation story must be a scientific text, and we're now going to set out to prove it. it's, it's so. Without really stepping back and saying, wait, it, it is that an appropriate assumption to make about the, 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 the scriptures? And who says that scientific reasoning is the highest form of truth? That if you went back to the ancients, to the people that this text was written to and the culture into which it was written and suggested that a journalistic scientific way of thinking was the highest form of communicating truth, they would have looked, like, looked at you like you're out of your mind. So we were trying to step away from that methodology, that mold, and say, what, what is this text saying within the context of the culture it was written and the things that they valued? And when you do that, you start to see things like the incredible use of, of rich poetic expressions in the text. And even things like just, you know, we mentioned the use of the number seven. It's not just sprinkled through scripture. If you start looking at what the, the numerologists have discovered in the Hebrew, in the creation story of Genesis 1, the, the number seven just is, is appears over and over and over and over and over again. This is not an accident. Even with like the opening line of the story, 
the first statement is seven Hebrew words. Well, I'm going to push back on I, that. Let me just add to that. Can I add on the concordance thing? I wrote a, I actually wrote an article for BioLogos on, I think I came up with nine different definitions of concordism. <laughs> so I'm, I'm interested <laughs> in that topic. So yeah, I, I mean, Greg and I would happily say we're non-concordist on that. However, it, the posture in the book is not, so I agree with the original statement, John, that yeah, I think concordism is probably maybe the biggest kind of um, divide and yet people don't necessarily know it. Um, however, I also want to posture towards those who might even assume a concordism that we're not telling you that you need to change that kind of whatever the philosophical, theological assumptions are behind that. We're not saying you have to give that up to appreciate the value of what we're saying in this book. You know, just just sideline them, put them on the back burner and and we want, you know, old earthers, young earthers, evolutionary creationists to, you know, to be together, you know, in that Bible study, appreciating the value of God's inspired scripture, regardless of uh, where they came in on those questions. And perhaps uh, if the book is convincing in some ways, maybe it'll alter their approach to those questions. Maybe it won't. Um, so while we're non-concordist, and I think you've, you've hit on a big deal, we also want to invite those who, who aren't skeptical, you know, who, who might be too skeptical to step away from that, uh, to still appreciate this and to, to do it with brothers and sisters who end up on different conclusions on those issues. Well put. Well, I want to push back on Greg a, a little bit. Um, you know, there, there is a philosophical idea that came out of the enlightenment, enlightenment about science being the highest truth. But I mean, right now in evangelical Christian America, um, I'm not seeing that. I, I don't see a very high value at all placed on evangelicals on looking at evidence-based science and accepting the findings of um, those who studied studied the topics or the issues and have researched it. Uh, in fact, it's almost the opposite. We should there. There's an attitude of um, rejecting the the uh the experts um in favor of everybody doing their own research and having their own opinion regardless of their educational background and knowledge of a subject um and what happened so that, that's a an excellent question that i i would actually phrase or describe in a, in a very different way um I think that they do actually still think of science as the highest form of truth, uh, often inappropriately applying that metric to scripture. But where the, the cognitive dissonance comes in, it's not distrust of science per se, it's distrust of scientists. So there's a perception in a lot of the evangelical community today that the scientific that, that many of these scientists are actually not doing good science that they are unconsciously immersed in a worldview that is in that way of thinking actually unscientific so philosophically conceptually science is valued but there's a distrust of the people that are calling themselves science scientists and what messages they're communicating the result is is a pretty big mess but i'll add to that that the part of the reason for that is the that you have uh, evangelical atheists that want to equate their science with atheism so that sets up a lot of that distrust of the the purveyors of those uh, scientific messages uh, and you have an alignment of some of the things that are coming out today with a, a, a particular political party that sometimes is very antithetical to the gospel. And so there's that other, that another juxtaposition that's making people distrust the scientists and hence unconsciously the science itself. Yeah, Hopefully that, just that wasn't there just for confusing. A second? I, I hate to push back <laughs> on my co-host, but... Um, I, I Go do ahead. agree uh, 
what you're saying that there seems to be a distrust for and, and what Greg pointed out is certain scientists, but it seems that they do phrase their arguments still in scientific terms that they're trying to appeal to science. So, for yes. example, when you're talking about COVID and mask wearing and so forth, they don't rebut uh, Dr. Fauci or Francis Collins or the NIH or the CDC um, with uh, non-science. They rebut it with quack science. Um, some chiropractor on YouTube. So there's the, they're still appealing to their scientists. And, it, and right. it comes out that what we're really seeing is motivated reasoning. Uh, what's called yes. whataboutism or motivated reasoning. Know. Where, they're they're where... also coming back with my rights. It's my right. I can yeah. do this, what I want. Well, um, and, and this might be uniquely American in, in that um, in, in our evangelical world, uh, because of the birth of our country and so forth and, and, and certain different things, in that corner of the evangelical world or Christian conservative world, we have this perfect storm of people who are distrusting of government, because uh, that's our birthright. They distrust, they certainly distrust the, the media. And of course, because of scopes and young earth creation and other things, they have a distrust for modern science. So when all three of those uh, voices are telling you to wear a mask and get vaccinated, you could see why there, there'd be some kickback there. Um, but I don't, I don't want to take us down a rabbit hole. So I, I, I think you're both right. But it, it, and it was a good point that you made, Christine, that it doesn't seem like they are embracing scientists uh, or science, but um, Thank you for pointing out the, the distrust of scientists. Yeah, well, Greg, and just to bring you... it back to the, the to the the book. Yeah. Um, where of course in this book, so both Ken and I have written specifically about apparent conflicts between science and, and the Bible. This book does not get into the scientific arguments. Uh, it is looking purely at the theological literary message of, of the text as it would have been understood to the original audience. Um, so apropos to what Christine was saying, that when you look at the amount of money that has been poured into uh, the, the, the Young Earth Movement, just for example, or the Discovery Institute with intelligent design, all or the bulk of the arguments are scientific in nature. Now they may we may deem that they're doing bad science or they're not doing science appropriately or correctly, but it's very very much focused on the science. So there is this sense of science is, is you know, of such great truth. Then Genesis must be a scientific text, and we miss so much of its beauty when we do that. Mm -hmm. So let's go back to uh, the different layers. Um, you referred to John Walton uh, and his work on the t on the temple text and describing Genesis as uh, a, a temple and, uh, and kind of feeds into worship as well. Um, talk a little bit about the temple layer. What is that layer? Um, I know for me, when I first heard about it, I thought, oh, the Bible doesn't really talk about temples very often. I mean, they build a tabernacle, they build a couple temples, they worship at the temple, but that's kind of all. And, and this, that really challenged me to kind of look for temple texts as I read through the Bible. And I was really surprised just to find it everywhere. Just all the, in Philippians chapter two, and just through, throughout the whole Bible, I see um, so many allusions to uh, the temple and a three-tier cosmology and um, the, the worship of the Israelites that I never saw before. Yeah, so you you can approach this there's kind of two angles. There's the the biblical angle, and then there's the ancient Near Eastern angle. And both Greg Beale and John Walton, or those are the two main ones we focus on, deal with both. And it, like you said, it, it's once once the idea is in your mind and you read through Scripture, you're seeing this everywhere, Old and New Testament. Um, and then when you get into the specifics. Uh, you start seeing real links between Eden and Sinai in particular. And there's like a list of like 15 elements that are easily matched. And most scholars have come around to kind of accept it. My mentor, Dan Block, is probably the one holdout who, who has the best critique against it. Um, but 
uh, it seems more and more people in my world are seeing this and saying, yes, th this is obvious once you see it the first time. I mean, anything from the idea of sacred space, being God's uh, in his presence, the work of Adam and Eve as being priests within the sacred space, which matches the, the tabernacle temple, um, the, the idea of being given commands to, to keep it pure, and what happens if you don't. Um, and then you could just look at major texts, Isaiah 65, 6, dealing with new heavens and earth, have temple language all over it. You know, it's calling the earth God's footstool. And then you go to Revelation 21 and 22, the other end of the Bible. It's all temple language. It's all priestly language. And so uh, when you've got an ancient nursing guy like John Walton and a really conservative biblical theologian like Greg Bill kind of coming to agreement, um, it makes a lot of sense. And on the ancient nursing stuff, John Walton makes the basic point. If you understand how the ancient world thought about temples, um, A, what you find is that temples and cosmology are just wrapped up in the same text. And we actually have an appendix that gives several examples of that. So they're always thinking of the temple as kind of a microcosm of, of the whole world. Um, and then the most basic point is that to talk about God resting on day seven, ask any ancient nourishing Israelite, or ancient Near Eastern person, uh, when you talk about resting, what does that mean? That obviously is dealing with God's resting in a temple. No one would have thought anything different. And so you can go with just the biblical data, but when you add the ancient Near Eastern stuff, it, to me it's, it becomes pretty convincing, and it looks like it's it, we could probably think of it something close to a consensus, at least within um, Old Testament scholarship. Yeah, I, I would add, well, the, so Ken brought up the ancient Near Eastern uh, texts and libraries and what's been learned. And he mentioned something a little earlier about discoveries that have been made just in the last, you know, say 200 years, which uh, brings up the concern of some people about the perspicuity of, of scripture, the idea that scripture should be understandable to all people at all times. And it's important to understand what that doctrinal statement means, that when theologians talk about that, Christian theologians, it's not that the entire Bible is easily understood for everybody in all cultures at all times. It's that the essential elements of the message of salvation are clear, regardless of what culture you're coming from and what age you're coming from, that when you read scripture, the basic elements of what you need to know about God's nature and what you need for salvation is, is clear. But there's obviously lots of parts of the Bible that take more study. Um, you know, if that wasn't true, we'd have no need for seminary degrees or for people to be theologians, right? Everybody could just read it once and you now you have to read it a second time. You just read it and you got it down pat. So what we're seeing in some of these layers that we're presenting is that as a result of uh, the discoveries made by some of these ancient Near Eastern texts, it's giving us glimpses into that culture of the time to simply expand our knowledge of Genesis, not reveal it for the first time. No, nobody understood Genesis until we made these discoveries. It simply allows us to expand our knowledge and appreciation of the text. All right, let, let's stay with the libraries of Sennacherib and Ashurbanipal for a second. And, and one of the criticisms of Christian theology is that whenever there's a new discovery, we just rewrite our theology to, to allow it to fit. So with Enuma Elish and the Epic of Gilgamesh coming out of that library and people looking at them and saying there's a lot of similarities, um, maybe the Hebrews just copied these stories and, and just uh, shaped them in their own way. So here's my question for you, gentlemen. You speak of the manifold beauty of Genesis 1, and I know there's similarities between these ancient Near Eastern creation myths, but what is the beauty that stands out for uh, both of you about the, the Hebrew creation story of Genesis 1 that's different from the others? And maybe we could start with you, Ken. Yeah, I, 
So it's interesting when you do the comparisons that there are, um, on one hand, you do, the, the similarities are important to notice. What are the things that they seem to agree? And those things tend to be like, say, the structure, the three-tiered structure that was alluded to earlier, uh, just this assumption that, that deity stands behind this in some way, that human beings have some kind of relationship within this, but but kind of the structure, what it looks like, is is kind of adopted and assumed, uh, but the, it's the theology that jumps off the page. And so things things like the fact that there's, obviously it starts with monotheism, or what Bruce Waltke calls ethical monotheism, right? The, the picture of Yahweh, the God of Israel, as compared to these other uh, gods and goddesses is completely different, starting that there's only one, which means right away, there never needs to be a conflict, never needs to be a fight like in Enuma Elish, um, and that this God knew what he was doing from the beginning. He had an order and a purpose with it. There's a, there's a beauty itself. When it says that it's good, that has to do with both the function and the aesthetic beauty of what he's doing, that he did it with intention, with purpose. He, had to, he only needed to speak by his word rather than to manipulate the creation. We didn't start with a chaotic state, but just something that needed to be formed and fashioned. And that human beings, um, unlike the other stories, are not slaves of the gods in order to do their work and give them a sense of sleep, but they are dignified with this exalted status of being his image bearers. And at the end of the, at the, end of the week, rather than this perpetual restlessness of the other gods, um, he's so satisfied, he calls it very good, and he's able to rest and then take rule. Uh, so those are the, some of the things that kind of jump off, I think, when you compare and contrast. Yeah, and that, what Ken was just describing was, comes out of our polemic layer. So that, that there's a whole layer that's just, how does this story contrast or correct the misconceptions of the religions that are surrounding Israel? Okay, let me let me ask just one follow up, and then I'll I'll hand the baton to Christine. And that is something I think I, I think we shared with John Walton um, a criticism from from a skeptic might sound like this. Um, we look at Genesis, and a lay reading of Genesis looks like the Hebrew world saying to the world around it, "Our God is better than your God," right? Um, because of these yep. differences that you just mentioned, and then you get to Exodus. <laughs> And you get the Hebrew world saying yep. to Egypt, our God is better than your God uh, because of these reasons. And then you get to Mars Hill and you have Paul saying our God is better than your God to the Greeks and the Romans. Uh, how do you respond to that kind of criticism that maybe the Bible isn't the word of God, but it's just very talented Hebrew storytellers <laughs> critiquing the world around? So, so this you're talking about a, a challenge from non-believers. Yes. Uh, yeah. So, I'll let Ken take a first stab at that. Yeah, I just one of the things I emphasize in that chapter on polemic is this idea of theological polemics. And John, you did a good job giving several examples. It, it's ubiquitous uh, in you know Elijah and Mount Carmel. You know that that our God is the biggest, baddest God in town is kind of the message. Um, I don't understand the criticism, actually, because it may assume too much of what the text is trying to do. And this might be a rabbit trail, but what it does for me, one of the things I do when I talk about polemics with my students is I say, imagine if Moses, whoever the author is, we'll just call him Moses, imagine he was writing Genesis 1 today. What would it sound like? Well, I suspect if you accept that there's something of a polemical angle, Genesis 1 would sound very different because what we have is a clash of worldviews and Moses or whomever is dealing with uh, the worldview or worldviews of, of, of Israel's day, but we would be speaking, you know, of a worldview clash in our day. And so whatever theological truth would be coming out, the story itself would be crafted in such a way to explicitly or at least implicitly uh, be exalting Yahweh versus whatever the idols of the current day is. And so for me, that doesn't, I don't understand the challenge as that being against God's word, but, but it's, a, it's a recognition that that is what God was doing in the text and not assuming that he was doing more like giving a very strict historical scientific presentation of what actually happened. All right, so... Um... 
trying to decide if I want to go off and ask. Well, I will. Okay. Uh, you mentioned monotheism, and that's the belief that there is only one God. But then you talked about, um, or John did, about uh, the Hebrew God being better than the other gods. And, and that is what we see, right? We see, we see Yahweh or Elohim defeating um, the Egyptian gods or countering the Babylonian gods in these polemics. Um, isn't that like a... I'm not even sure how to pronounce it. Uh, monolatry. Monolatry or henotheism. Yeah, instead of. So when I use the term monotheism, I'm using it theologically, not etymologically. And um, for those interested in the whole issue of what's now commonly called the Divine Council, Michael Heiser's right. name comes up a lot in this. I'm all into that. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so I think we need to separate kind of the etymology, the words, the, the phenomenon in the scripture versus what we might put into a theological term. The fact of the matter is the, the, the Bible does recognize other gods. gods. Um, calls them God, sometimes calls them sons of God, and then there's a whole host of other names. And, the, it, and so, so at that level, yes, if we're thinking of theism at that level, are there other divine beings other than Yahweh? The clear evidence of the Old Testament is yes, and New Testament. Um, it's just that our Christian theology is coming off more of the New Testament and post-New Testament discussion. So what we're more comfortable talking about is angels, because that's a different conceptualization coming from the Greco-Roman background, get into the whole Persian Zoroastrianism. So, but really, what I would say in big picture is that the Old Testament recognizes these other beings, calls them Elohim or B'nai Elohim, uh, and identifications. They generally fit, if I'm thinking in a large theological way, into what we talk of as angels and demons, just uses different terminology. So that view of monolatry or henotheism um, can still fit within a view of biblical monotheism if what we're talking about by the mono, the one, is that there is only one one being who's eternal and has all the, the 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 traditional categories of omniscience and omnipresence and and so on and so forth. So in that sense, it fits theologically monotheism. But you and that's part of the our problem is we are again I'm an Old Testament guy. We often read as as conservative we read through the lens of our creedal tradition in the New Testament and have to realize sometimes the text speaks differently than those traditions. But it still fits within Orthodox Christianity. You just need some time to to let and, and look at the data and think about it. If that's satisfying well, to you, Christine, or do you want to follow? Um, up? Yeah, it, it is. Yeah. Uh, I think it's a good question because sometimes you'll hear uh, like an atheist say, "Well, yeah. um, you know, you you're a monotheist. You just believe in one God, and you don't believe in any of the Greek or Hebrew or." Uh, Norwegian gods, uh, you, and I just believe in one less god than you. Sure. So um, I just think it's ca kind of good to talk about those ideas too. Yeah. Um, but we're kind of straying from your book. So um, are See, there any yeah, layers? Michael Heiser is the name to, to know on those yeah. issues. So. Are there any layers that uh, you wanted to be in the book, but um, just didn't make it, either you didn't have enough support or um, just seem, you know, you wanted to stick with the number seven and let's go with you, Greg, first on that one. Well, I think I mentioned earlier that there were probably five layers that very easily came to us, uh, that, that seemed very natural. And then we were digging a little deeper to see what other, other layers were out there. Um, we were very content with the seven we came up with. I know Ken uh, had bounced around an idea of like a Christological layer and you know between the two of us didn't feel like we had uh, enough to really flesh that out for an eighth layer uh, but when I when I mentioned earlier that you know it's important to communicate to readers that this is not an all or nothing proposition where you have to accept all seven or it doesn't work we, we also say in the introduction that we're, we're not making any claim that this is the seven and that's it you know that anything beyond that is is outside of the bounds of, of good biblical theology. 
And I would just say, I, I honestly, for at least from my understanding of my plan, I don't know of other logical layers that would be prominent. The Christological one, we, as Greg said, um, I think I could have made an attempt at it, but I think there's others probably more uh, qualified for that. Uh, we do talk a lot about uh, Christ and the New Testament in the book, and particularly the last layer gets into some real messianism taking place in the text, which is kind of a segue. If I could hand it off to a New Testament scholar who's into to Christological readings, I, I think we, we make an attempt to kind of make an overture towards it. Um, you know, that part of it was the seven, but I think we would have broken that if we thought it was important. We were also getting to our, our page limit. We wanted to keep it under a couple hundred pages, uh, given our intention and audience. But I would love for somebody to, to read this, kind of buy into it, and and add more to it. That'd be great. Yeah, Christine, if you, you've got that book handy, you hold it up so, so people can see the spine and how thick it is. Yeah. Yeah, that, 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 that's on purpose. Yeah, that thickness. Yeah. So it's, it's designed pretty, to be. It's a pretty easy read. It's got a. Yeah. It's got yeah, it's, like it, tables and figures and. Um, right, because this is it, even though it comes kind of, out of Kriegel Academic, it is yeah. not intended as just an academic text. Uh, it is intended for yeah. There you go <laughs> for uh, the the just the you know the educated lay reader. Well, I'm going to have to share my 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 view of it off air with you. I've, I've got a wedding view of it that, that I'll marriage, share with y'all. Marriage layer, you forgot the marriage layer. <laughs> <John's laughs> oh, yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. yeah. Um, sure. uh, from uh, social media, we have uh, John Griffin say, saying I'll lob in a question earlier. He's an author, uh, Dr. John Griffin, because I'll be driving later. What is one thing each of you learned in the course of researching and writing this book? Um, before you answer okay. that, before you answer that, I've got a direct question for Greg, and then maybe you could give your answer, and we will go to Ken on that. But Greg, you're a geologist, uh, and I know you um, love theology, but I'm just curious, uh, this was your idea. Was this your idea because you were dismayed about how much of uh, the talk about Genesis had, uh, revolved around science, or what? what kind of instigated your passion about this and, and why you took it to Kenneth? And then maybe you can answer John's question. Yeah, yeah. so that with many things of that nature, it's, it's a journey. And, you know, there's not necessarily one thing that one could uh, uh, point to. The, where it kind of all started many years ago was just seeing how much anxiety and, and chaos and tension and arguments that were going on internally, you know, not, not just between the church and the world, but within the church over this, these apparent science and faith tensions and, and a lot of really, really bad science and bad theology that needed some voices of reason and and i felt like i had some unique things to be able to contribute to that uh and through working through some of those arguments and and doing writing about you know explicitly about apparent conflict between the bible and science and and looking back at sort of the history of how the church has addressed previous apparent uh conflicts that out of that grew this recognition that you know wait we we're, we're missing a whole element to this conversation that this idea of the richness and multifacetedness of the text that has just been lost and we we quote uh an ancient pope named gregory the great in, in our book who was doing a commentary on job and he you know at the time that they were very comfortable with looking at scripture from you know approaching it from different uh, perspectives and he spoke of just job and scripture in general as being uh, a book that was shallow enough that a lamb could walk and deep enough that an elephant could swim and then he proceeded to write where you've got one layer that's very easy to understand from a cursory reading of the text but then as you dig deeper, you start to see more and more and more beauty based on the questions you're bringing to it. Um, 
Ken, I, you probably forgot the original question, but John Griffin wanted no, to know, no. is there anything you learned that really jumped out at you while you were researching this book? So a, a couple of things. Yeah, a couple of things. One, the strengths and weaknesses of, of having a co-author. I've co-edited a book before, but the fact that Greg and I are still friends and stronger friends is uh, testimony of God's grace. But, but really, that was a great process and it, much harder to do than maybe you think you're cutting the work in half. That's not true at all. No. Um, but more sensitively on it, um, I was surprised that with all of the layers that Genesis 1 is cannot be read on its own. In fact, we, we had trouble, you know, having a title with Genesis 1. We spent so much time in Genesis 2, Genesis 3, the Pentateuch, that it really is integrated into the larger levels of the story. And so to isolate this one text is simply misreading it. It's not an introduction. It's not background. It is part and parcel of the story. And it did really, one of the, the early um, reviews of the book noted something we hoped it would notice that in some ways, this is kind of a little primer on biblical theology of all kinds of themes, covenant, land, temple, time, uh, work, rest, Sabbath, and that Genesis 1 needs to be part of those large theological themes, not just as some kind of uh, background before you get to the good stuff. Even the gospel itself, as our African-American Christians uh, know more than we do, that the gospel begins in Genesis 1, not Genesis 3. So um, one of the views that you don't have is some kind of a literalist, concordist, uh, young earth creationist, um, straightforward. It just is the plain um, reading that an Amer a seven-year-old American would get from the text. Um, uh, you, you know, wh why don't you have a view that, I mean, that's a really common view. That's like, I know so many people who just, I just read it. I don't, um, I don't want to distort the text. I just want to read it. It's not even an interpretation. I just read it and that's what it says. Yeah. Uh, but you don't even have a chapter on that. So, um, is that not the way you were supposed to read Genesis one? Okay. And if it's not read that way, are we saying it's not true? Uh, Greg, why don't you take so, this first? Go ahead, Greg. Uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll I'll give a partial answer and then hand off to, to Ken. Um, so we were, for, well, to, for starters, and I know you're not saying this, but but you're repeating what what others have said. Right. That the those that are claiming to just read the words and just taking them literally never really are. There are a whole host of assumptions and uh, uh, non-literal gyrations that are made as that text is read. I mean, e even just just as one of many many examples, you know, the whole idea of the first three days being created without a, a sun. That you'll hear explanations in support of the the literal view that well, those were figurative representations or metaphor. Uh, uh, just illustrative representations of something that would eventually be true. Well, that's an immediate departure from a literal reading. So that that's an answer at one level, saying that there's there really is no such thing that we've ever seen of people that are consistently being literal. Uh, but more fundamentally, we were trying to step away from this Western 21st century notion of science being the highest form of truth, this must be a scientific text, and simply letting the text speak for itself in the context and culture in which it was written. And you, and, and as we're looking at the richness of it and having complementary layers, you know, that, that we're, we're not writing a four competing views of, these are all complementary layers, we are explicitly looking for those layers that are overlapping, that are tiling, that are supporting each other, that are expanding on this understanding of this magnificent text, as opposed to being in competition with it. And the modern version of a, a literalistic reading does, does not fit into that. Ken, you can uh, yeah. have, have Ken has yeah, more to say on that. that. Yes. So my one point bluntly is there, I don't know, there is not really a literal reading of the text. 
they're not reading it as a piece of literature. Doesn't mean they don't believe that, but but what they're they're bringing these philosophical, scientific, historical assumptions in, and they're picking apart different texts. But it's not a reading of a text. The the fact that they almost in the, at least the more popular creationist discussion don't even talk about day seven, the Sabbath, tells me they're not reading it as a text when that's the climax of the text. But assuming there is a reading, it is not a literary theological reading. Um, even saying literal with a certain understanding what that means, because I would say all of our layers are literal meanings. If we mean what the author originally intended, that fits with the rest of scripture, but it's those even calling it young earth creationism, right? Or old earth creationism or evolutionary creationism. Those are scientific terms. They're not theological terms. And so I would just say bluntly that the supposed literal view is not a literary theological reading. And as we said before, if somebody comes from that background, great. We're not telling you have to give it up. Um, this is something to add, not necessarily replace how you approach the text. And I think added to that, we think this is what you should be focusing on. And then if you want to argue later what the, you know, the, the length of a day is or, or how this matches with scientific data, fine. But that's secondary. Um, but if you start with that, then you're already off on the wrong foot. Yeah, I, I will add one thing to that. that uh, so the annual meeting of the Evangelical Theological Society uh, was just held in Fort Worth um, last month. And Ken gave a presentation that was not just describing the book, but kind of talking about the, the pastoral uh, aspects of, of the book and where this could be used. And we knew, I was there too, we, we knew that there were some leaders in the Young Earth community that were in that audience. And one of the last things that Ken shared was a, a bit of uncertainty of how it would be received within that particular community. And he, he opened it up for input from the audience. And the first guy that shared is, is, is very well known. Well, actually, we, we know both of the those individuals very well. Um, the first one I actually have a lot of respect for, but still just surprised the socks off of me when he said that this, this fits with what we would like within know that I don't see us having a big issue with this. And then the next guy chimed in and I thought, well, he, all right, he's going to set the record straight. And he didn't, he said, he, he basically reiterated it. So that gives us a lot of hope for the impact and inroads that a book like this could make. And let me, let me add to that, that with, within the young earth creationist community, since we're talking about them, we could do the same with, with others. Uh, but given my homeschool background and, and my conservative context of, of where I've been educated and teaching, right, most people I know are young earth gracious. There, there are kind of two types, right? There's the Ken Ham type, that this is everything about what they are, their approach, their ministry, their budget. I don't expect this book to make much of a dent. If it's read at all, we'll probably be critiqued. Greg and I have been uh, the whipping boys, <laughs> other things. I'm not interested in that group. It's like it's like talking about atheism and trying to convince Richard Dawkins. Richard Dawkins is not the type of person most of us you know, probably should be spending our time. But on the other hand, there's a whole group that are much larger, but don't get the, the publicity, like a Ken Ham or a Richard Dawkins, that they may be willing to engage in real discussions. These are my students. These are the people I go to church with. They don't you know, they're young earth creationists because that's what they've been taught. It seems like the obvious thing, but they don't dwell on it. It's not something that they're drawing lines of disfellowship. I think, I th and I've already tested this with some students, and maybe it's because I'm their teacher, but there's been a very ge uh, a generally positive embrace and an acceptance and allowance to ask questions. So, yeah, it'll be interesting if that continues, if, if they don't feel threatened. And that's that's part of our posture is we're not telling you to change your view before you open up these pages. So are you having any pushback saying that if you hold to a polemic view or to an analogy that then you're, what you're saying is this text isn't really true? Any pushback like that? I have not heard that in my, as a teacher of students, 
I hear that in the more popular discussions, but never, never directly, right? It's the things you, you read uh, mm -hmm. or the critiques of a John Walton, for instance, sometimes you'll see that, but in actual engagements, I just haven't come across it. Um, I, I, I was at another institution that has a creationist background. I suppose there may have been some of that. There's a reason I switched institutions. Um, but it's not something generally, right? Unless somebody just thinks this is the heart of the gospel, and there's a few who do. I just, I think people are, are generous, especially if they trust you, right? If there's a certain relationship there. So I, I just haven't come across that. Maybe Greg has. Well, I mean, I, um, I have experience with a couple people who do think this is the heart of the gospel. Um, yeah. My kids have been told they're not really Christians. We're not really Christians if we don't hold a young earth view. Um, that somehow the resurrection isn't enough. You also have to have a particular position on biology and geology and stuff. Um, yeah. And I have to tell you, it's very hurtful yeah. when Christians tell my kids or any kids or adults even that type of thing um so i really hope your book can reach people and help them help more people see that this this you know there's a broad range of faithful ways to read this passage and and see the beauty and and love the text and love what it's saying about god and creation without Oh, I don't know, harassing people who have a different view. Well, no, I hear that. Which leads yeah. me to yeah. one of those um, warnings that Christine laid on y'all. Sometimes I have long winded questions. So let me jump in here and try and be pithy. Um, you're both in academic climates. You're, you're both aware that there is a exodus from the church of young people, um, actually all ages now. Um, and part of it has to do with this kind of God's not dead idea that, um, that the whole world's against us and, um, you can't trust yeah. secular scientists or secular professors. And once you get to the university, they're going to sprinkle dust on you and you're going to turn into a heathen. Um, <laughs> but what's really happening is people that grew up under the circumstances that you mentioned, Ken, um, they take one class in geology or biology or anthropology or even a uh, first semester of New Testament and the house of cards that has been their faith just, um, just, just evaporates. And what Christine and I do here at Voices in the Wilderness, we're trying to meet those people on their journey and tell them that it's not a dichotomous choice between what Ken Ham makes it, which is the authority of the Bible and a literal reading of Genesis uh, and atheism. And there are two groups that, that, that kind of peddle that message. One of them is the Richard Dawkins that you mentioned, who <laughs> loves to have that literal reading. And the other is not just young earth creationism, but the creationism movement. So I would just say this, I would point to a famous debate between Peter Atkins and Hugh Ross, who's an old earth creationist. And Peter mm -hmm. Atkins was asked by the host, what would convince you that the, you know, the Bible is the word of God? And he said something to the sort of, if it contained E equals MC squared in it or something like that. This idea that if the Bible, you know, in ancient times could include something within the text that we in modern times can read and say, wow, that, that you know, this this is out of this world. This is metaphysical. This is a miracle. Uh, and while Hugh Ross wouldn't acknowledge that E equals MC squared is in there, I think the whole creationism movement or even the concordist reading of these texts like to argue that that's what the Bible is, that God is, God is pointing to. I've even heard people um, suggest that um, smart missiles are, are contained in Jeremiah you know, right. And, and that kind of technology. Um, so to the question itself, um, I, I know you want Concordus to read your book and, and to have an open mind coming into this. Uh, but just this morning, Caleb Poston, uh, shared an article where he interviewed, um, Dennis Lamoureux, 
um, oh. and uh, N. T. Wright, and also Michael Ruse. So, and, and oh, that's and, interesting. Uh, yeah, an evangelical, um, an atheist, and an Anglican. And he asked him about the war between science and and faith. And Dennis Lamro said it really comes down to how you read the Bible. It really comes down to how you read the Bible with the people within the faith. And the Concordance view really is actually the underlying culprit of uh, of this unnecessary war. And uh, N.T. Wright kind of pointed to people like you, and BioLogos and Francis Collins, and he says this is kind of an American thing. Uh, hey, uh, you people in America, go listen to BioLogos. And, and he didn't mention your book, but I think your book would fit in along those categories, giving an alternate reading between the dichotomous view. But Michael Ruse said this, the atheist said this, um, information isn't going to fix this, that, that, that this is an emotional investment with these people, and it's going to take more than information to fix it. So granted those three views, they, the author Caleb said, it's got to be an eclectic mix of all three of these things. You know, this idea that we can show them you don't, you don't have to read Genesis like that. Um, and here's the question, and it comes from the web. Um, Eddie Adams says, is there any reliable statistical evidence or do you have a personal opinion of whether old earth creation or theological evolution beliefs are on the increase within the church? Well, young earth creationism is declining. I hope that is the case. Uh, what is your sense of the ground right now where this conversation is going? You said you haven't had much kickback against your book. Um, but what, what is your sense? Um, and is this a wilderness generation that's just going to have to die off? Or do you really have an optimistic view that your book and ministries like Walton and BioLogos can actually have an effect with people who are dug in? Well, it, at one level, you know, if we said we didn't have any hope, there would have been no point in writing the book, right? Uh, so just by virtue of all the investment that went into this book, there there is a hope that it is going to make an impact. And I, I think we are seeing a, a, a shift. But in terms of the culture as a whole, I think that what we're seeing on a smaller scale on the questions of uh, science in the Bible are reflected in a larger on a larger scale with just the increasing polarization of America that and and social media is a huge culprit in that process where people are getting fed more and more information that aligns with their preconceived notions and are moving them farther and farther apart um, but within that context there's still a sizable number of people that are in, in part because they have been prompted to ask challenging questions and not just accept what they were brought up to believe uh, rotely, that they, as they begin to explore, they're encountering things like BioLogos, they're encountering things that, that both Ken and I have written before, and then hopefully this book that's coming out that really will begin to move that needle. And you know, when Ken says we haven't experienced a lot of pushback uh, on this particular book, it's only been out since late October. So the, 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 I think time will tell as the book be, does begin to get more exposure, what kind of pushback we may get. You asked right, about so specific stats. There, there was a sociologist from Calvin that was involved. Uh, There's a whole set of people who got grants uh, from the Templeton Foundation through BioLogos. That's how Greg and I met. There was a sociologist, and I'm forgetting his name, but he's continued to track some of those numbers. And there is a, a change. I just don't remember the actual statistics, but I don't think we're ever gonna change completely. I, there's a growing acceptance of at least some evolutionary factors. In some ways, the, the debate has shifted from evolution to historical atom. Um, that'd be a different conversation on, on whether that is helpful or not. Um, but I think, I think the strategy that I'm seeing, at least in my little world, is to it's kind of like god's strategy in the bible he usually doesn't like create revolution revolutions overnight he takes people where they're at and kind of inches them along towards progress 
And I suspect that's what this is going to be. As you'd mentioned, there's this kind of three-pronged approach. We need to, right, there's a lot of sociology in this. It, it's not the arguments uh, that are going to win the day, but it's going to be showing yourself to be trustworthy and faithful, that you're a Christ follower and you actually believe your Bible, even when you come to conclusions that seem crazy at first to them, uh, working with them, walking alongside of them. I, I think it's going to be that pastoral approach uh, if we are going to see some type of change rather than a world of ideas and a bunch of YouTube debates. All right. So, so I'm going to kind of drill into that a bit. Um, with COVID, uh, the number of families who've chosen to homeschool has increased dramatically, possibly even doubled in the past, say, two years. Um, and a number of Christians, uh, when they choose to homeschool, opt for Christian curriculum and why wouldn't you? I mean, if you're going to take the opportunity to homeschool your family, let's let's pick Christian curriculum. And especially when kids are little, they they choose curriculum that's that's maybe not even not even thinking about the science involved. Uh, in fact I was talking with um, some people we know who did start homeschooling and they just flat out told me, I mean, they're too little to think about the science. We don't need to talk about consensus or something else. They're, we're just going to teach them the Bible and the basics. And and they have, in the past year and a half, become full-fledged uh, Ark Encounter visitors, uh, homeschooler, young earth creationists. And, and they're being fed a very steady diet of read, read your Bible literally and this is the genesis is young earth creationism and that's really foundational um and, and it wasn't um and then they probably never intended that or it considered it or even evaluated it it's just what ha what i've seen happen this year um right. how do we reach families like this i mean how do we get into the homeschool environment um the homeschool conventions are very often very careful at screening who present or have material. Um, I, you know, I had actually been hopeful that more people were accepting evolution, but with COVID, I, I've i seen an increase in hostility toward evidence-based science and medicine and a, a digging in against science. Yeah, there's a, I I haven't been a, go ahead. I was just going to uh, jump in with, uh, and Ken will share more about actually his personal experience with the homeschool movement. But uh, one thing that I've found, and this actually is pertinent from both the perspective of just the scientific community trying to promote good science and the church trying to wrap their arms around you know, what, what what is good science and what isn't. And there's, on both sides, there is the misconception that if we just make good materials that explain the science well enough, we'll, we'll convince people. And mm -hmm. But what happens is when it's on the scientific side, when it's the, uh, you know, the, the Dawkins of this world that are presenting this and the Christians know that there's this underlying atheistic worldview under it, it doesn't matter how good the scientific materials are. They're never read. And on the Christian side, when they're trying, when you're, if you're just trying to communicate just the science, there's, it's the same thing. It doesn't matter how good the materials are. They, they aren't going to believe if the messenger isn't believable. So one of the things that we've tried to do is to back that up and to actually look at the scripture and, and tell people that, you know, you have to address what is the Bible actually saying? How do we evaluate what it is saying? What, um, you know, when we say that there's these apparent conflicts, are they actually even in conflict? And when you can start by saying, look, I believe the Bible's true. I believe it's inspired. Uh, let's go back and take a look at, at some of the historical examples of how, like in the days of Galileo, when there seemed to be this major conflict, how did they work through those kinds of conflicts? To get to the point where you know the church today doesn't think that the earth is the center of the universe how in the world did that happen without giving up biblical authority when we can start at that level 
and get people to understand what the Bible is actually saying, then it's possible to take that next step of saying, all right, let's look at the science itself. So even though in my case, you know, I wrote Friend of Science, Friend of Faith first, and then teamed up with Ken on this Manifold Beauty of Genesis 1, I would actually recommend reading them in reverse. Start with the Manifold Beauty of Genesis 1. What is the Bible actually saying? And then if you still feel like you're wrestling with some of the science issues, you can go on to a book like Friend of Science, Friend of Faith that then dives into some of the specifics about the scientific evidence. So in my experience, there, there are more people in the homeschool world quietly asking questions, but again, there's a sociology to it um, where you don't feel like if you're not with the group think that you can say something out loud, maybe particularly in that subculture, because I continue to get emails <laughs> quietly asking for help. Um, and so again, my former institution, we had about a third of our students come from the homeschool world. My, my two oldest were young and we ended up starting to homeschool and had a good experience overall. But yeah, we, we face this both as parents and me as a teacher. And um, so this is how Greg and I met is because I was working with a, a colleague of mine who was a biology teacher. And we just said, look, our students, it doesn't matter if they come from public school, private school or homeschool, they don't know really what evolution is. They don't have anything more than a simplistic understanding of how to read the Bible. So we had decided to team up and our strategy was, so this is one way to do it. Our strategy was, and we haven't finished the project, maybe it's time to pick it up now, was to say, look, we're not going to tell you to throw away your, your homeschool textbook, um, though I would suggest to some, why not just have a secular textbook to teach you biology? But if you're not willing to do that, fine. But here's a supplementary resource that's easily readable that comes along and says, look, this is why scientists say what they they say and why you don't have to buy it, you don't have to agree with it, but just at least know. And, and as Greg just mentioned, this is what conservative, evangelical, Bible-believing, Old Testament scholars actually do with the text. And then you come at the end with, a, he, these are the strengths and weaknesses in different Christians. So I think part of it is trying to call for patience and seeing variety, sorry, you see my cat jumping behind me. Um, and to get them to, to continue that conversation rather than winning it. You know, I, I do this with evangelism. If you could just win another cup of coffee and another visit, right? If you could drag this conversation out so that your relationship develops and then you get to the nitty gritty. I don't really know another solution. You could try to produce, you know, massive textbooks, which are gonna be really expensive. But I think that kind of supplementary resource that comes alongside, not telling you to throw away your textbook or get out of this group necessarily, uh, but, but here's another thing to consider, and oh, by the way, this is more in line with kind of church history than maybe what you've been told. All right, so BioLogos has a supplemental curriculum now for high school ages, um, but sometimes I wonder, isn't that too late? I mean, by the time if they've grown up and become pretty hard-nosed young earth creationists in elementary school and middle school, I, I are they going to choose a supplemental curriculum for high school or is it just going to happen that they get to college and then half of them lose their faith and the other half wrestle through things and dig in deeper or, or something like that? Um, how, how do we yeah, really I suspect those resources? Are? I suspect those resources are not meant to convert people along the way, though they, they, right. hope, they probably hope they would. And I think they're pretty expensive, to be honest. Um, I think you're right. I think we, I think and what we need to do is here, here's one thing, and I don't know how effective this might be. Um, I do think we need to start thinking about science in a theological sense. I mentioned this before, but, but what scientists do is they're examining God's world. And that's part of what we call in theology, general revelation. And all revelation is coming from God, whether it's special revelation from the Bible <laughs> or general revelation, if we could put it in those theological terms to say, God's not deceiving you. He's not lying. He actually wants you to learn information. And it's not always on the pages of scripture, but there is a God and he's trying to teach you things. And this is 
this is the world that he's created for and he's created us in his image and at least part of that is he's given us the capacity to understand his world i think if we could talk big picture like that about god's world and then when you get to the nitty-gritty stuff because what we need is we need christians in these sciences and they're not doing it right they're becoming doctors and engineers but they're not going into the hard sciences so it's almost a, a continual loop because we don't have more in there gentlemen you've been very generous with your time and as we wind up the program i just want to ask one last question but thank you for joining us uh, folks the manifold beauty of genesis one is available now perfect stocking stuffer um, i've got a kindle version so i can't brag about it and hold it up and wave it like christine <laughs> but um I, I just want to ask you a very simple question and um in two parts uh, the first part is if i'm sitting next to you on an airplane and we're about to um get off that airplane you only have a few minutes to talk to me and i ask you well what is genesis one trying to uh, teach what is genesis one about what would you say and the second thing is, of the seven views that you mentioned in your book, what, what are the ones that are most compelling to you personally? And maybe we could start with, um, with you, Greg, and then move over to Ken. Yeah, so fundamentally, what I think that Genesis, and, and really, you could almost say this about the entire Bible, is communicating is the nature of God and his relationship with his people. So you'd be hard pressed anywhere in scripture to find an intention of helping us understand nature better or how nature functions. It is communicating who is God and what is, what is his relationship with his people and his, his larger creation. Uh, in terms of my, my favorite layers are the ones that resonate the most with me. Uh, I, I could not say just one, uh, cause I, I really, I, I have embraced the idea of the, the multifaceted beauty of this text. Um, but of the seven, probably the ones that, that I really appreciate the most would be the song, uh, embracing some of these poetic uh, aspects of the text and the parallel days that are set up of, of the filling and for, uh, excuse me, creating, uh, addressing formlessness and emptiness. And first three days, addressing the, the formless problem, the second three days addressing the empty problem. And we, we didn't really talk about this, that layer in this session, but that's that's one of my favorites. But then also the, the contrast with the surrounding pagan views, the polemic, which, you know, if we spent more time, we'd actually see that that has some amazing relevance for today. It's not just challenging worldviews of the ancient uh, Near East. It challenges pagan worldviews today. Uh, and then probably the covenant layer that's looking at this covenant relationship that God established, not only with his people, but with the creation itself. Yeah, and if I was on an airplane, I would say that Genesis 1 is a text about God. By the end of it, we should be on our knees worshiping this great God. It's giving us a sense of what he's up to in this world and his original intention. And then, of course, the story is going to go into things that what happened and what God's kind of rescue, <laughs> restoration operation is about. But it, it really fits into the, the larger meta narrative of the Bible. And so it's trying to tell something about the character of who this God is and us as his image bearers. Uh, in terms of layers, uh, bad at favorite, I, I would say I really like the, uh, the analogy one uh, that really effectively becomes a theology of work because it, it demonstrates coming off of the, the song analogy, the poetics involved in the text, it really gives you kind of an anthropomorphic feel of how it's describing God, which I think it goes a long way to asking other questions. The polemic, I think, is part and parcel of, of what the Bible's doing. Um, the temple text, I think, is, is uh, again, it's becoming increasingly embraced. And I think that's helpful because it makes you read the whole, uh, certainly the Pentateuch, the whole Old Testament differently. Um, I'm intrigued by the calendar. I'm, I'm interested to see what my colleagues do as the book continues to get traction that we that we use uh, Lefevre's approach. Uh, I learned a lot. And so regardless of how it connects to Genesis 1, I'm probably interesting. Greg mentioned covenant because that's probably the one that I'm um, a bit most tentative on. 
um, on, on what to do with the language of covenant. I see the connections, I see the parallels, but I also understand some of the objections. The one on land, I think, does a lot of good things uh, in terms of what it's doing with, with Genesis 1. Um, yeah, I still have questions myself. <laughs> Well, I'm going to give Christine the last word. Again, it was a joy to have you gentlemen. And uh, we, we celebrate your, your ministry. And uh, we recommend to all who listen uh, to give your book a read. And um, Christine, last words? Yeah, no, thank you so much for joining us today. It was um, really great to talk about it. And uh, to see that you have hope that people will read your book and it will build bridges rather than building um more tension about different views and uh, maybe another analogy for the seven layers would be the seven layer salad that we're going to have for christmas um <laughs> where you get a bite a bite of each layer each uh, each time you uh scoop some of your salad and don't forget um, the donkeys part enjoy it all together and yeah. may it bring people to worship god so thank you for joining thank us you. and uh yeah, I'll, I'll just uh, kind of wrap things up with a, 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 an observation that in this world of trying to get a message like this out that could actually be of benefit and, and maybe bring some healing and unity, that the people think that if once you've got a, a publisher that, that, oh, they just let the whole world know. And they, in fact, have very small marketing budgets. So one of the most significant ways that you can help get the word out is that if you do get a copy and read it, just take the time to post a review. It doesn't have to be a whole synopsis of the book. It can be just a short paragraph of, of what the book meant to you. And that communicates to other people that, oh, you know, as, as that number ticks up on reviews, that there must be something here worth reading. And it, it really does help. And I think you mean, especially on Amazon. Is that right? Yeah, or Goodreads. Um, or wherever books are sold. Christianbook.com. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. Or share this podcast right here. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Thank you all for joining us. Merry Christmas. We'll see you again soon. Merry Christmas. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. It was a pleasure. Thanks.